it is then. Everybody loves the greatest showman. Kids, adults, fish. Seems like everyone's united under their common love of this 2017 musical. Admittedly, I can't really blame them for loving it so much. It's colorful, the songs are catchy, the actors are likable, and the story is simple enough for the average audience to understand. It's a perfectly fine family film that just about everyone can enjoy in some aspect, but of course, not everyone likes this movie, as one will find by looking at any review. Critics are, for the most part, not big fans of the Hugh Jackman-led musical, while audiences ate it up. Well, yeah, but this ain't so different from other film musicals, especially ones adapted from stage productions. Rent and Phantom of the Opera both show this trend, although films like Into the Woods actually have a reverse problem. But this isn't always the case. I mean, look at Les Miserables which ironically also had Jackman attached. Critics and audiences both liked it, and it managed to be accessible for the average moviegoer and compelling enough for people wanting a solid film behind it. So yeah, it's not like The Greatest Showman is any different in reception from these fellow musicals, so why do I dislike it so much? Is it perhaps because I'm a cynical monster who dislikes happiness and can't appreciate a crowd pleaser? Every moviegoer in America liked The Greatest Showman a lot, but Justin from Justin's Town lived in Southern California, did not. Justin hated the film, the whole soundtrack too. Oh now don't ask why, he hasn't time for you. No, no I, I'm gonna explain why I don't like it. It's, it's not like I won't tell people why. I'm Just, just give me a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm leading up to that. So the story, for those of you who aren't familiar, is about how P.T. Barnum created the first circus way back in the 19th century, and how the art of show business first began thanks to the wonders that Barnum brought the people. It's also the story of how Hugh Jackman and his friends made a billion dollars for singing songs that sound like they're off of an Imagine Dragons album. The movie starts off with Hugh Jackman. I'm just not going to call him P.T. Barnum. He's just Hugh Jackman. I mean, look at the actual P.T. Barnum. And now look at Hugh Jackman. They are not the same. It's been confirmed. Phoenix Wright agrees. They are not the same person. Anyway, Hugh Jackman's singing a song at the circus, and he looks like Bane about to blow up the stadium under the seats. Let the games begin! And that gets all, like, spooky and ominous, and Hugh looks like birds are about to come and eat him and leave behind his single screw eye. Yep, that's a We're Back a Dinosaur Story reference for all you fans of John Goodman's other animated movie. Well, anyway, it looks like we're with some kid now, who I'm assuming is Kid Hugh Jackman, and he's looking at his clothes from the future? Now hold your dang horses. How does he see the circus clothes that he wears 10 to 20 years in the future as a kid when the circus isn't even invented yet? Is, is this a flashback, a flash forward, a dream sequence of his ideal circus even though that wasn't even his idea in the first place, it was his kids in the future? I'm only like five minutes into this movie and I'm already having an existential crisis. You've got to calm down here, Hugh. This is not the fountain. You don't have to confuse me. Hey, didn't they bury Dobby here? So it looks like Hugh Jackman and the girl he was with, who grows up to be Michelle Williams, get married and have two daughters. However, things don't seem to be working out for Jackman at his job, and he soon gets fired. So, to recap, we have a main character who wants to follow his dreams, who then finds true love only to get fired from his job by a mean boss man to live his life in vaguely described poverty. Yeah, that sounds pretty much like every family film ever. So Jackman then decides to take out fake money from a sunken ship in China and purchase a museum to show the people a bunch of lifeless mannequins and stuff. You know, as you do when your family is in poverty. But the museum is lame, no one likes it, so then Jackman's kids go, Why don't you make something more alive? And then Hugh goes, Alive? Huh? And then he decides to hunt down a bunch of freaks and put them in a show. If I could just... Back that up for just a second. Hugh's first idea when his daughters tell him to make the show more alive is to turn it into a comedy show starring people with physical deformities. I, 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 don't, I don't know, I, I would have thought like maybe make a zoo or something, make an make a aviary, not expose these guys for money. I know that's what happened in real life and all and you gotta be historically accurate or whatever. But still, the movie tries to make you think Jackman is the good guy when his mentality for making the show more alive is to use the insecurities of others for his financial gain and then pawn it off as being defiant to those who don't like them. It's just downright manipulative, so I'm having a hard time rooting for Hugh here. 
Although I would have an easier time rooting for Hugh Jackman if he, you know, grew Wolverine claws and it turns out this is actually a hidden X-Men spinoff where he's been brainwashed into thinking that he's P.T. Barnum and all the freaks are actually mutants and he has to rebel against Magneto. I have this whole story planned out. If you ever want to hear about it, just DM me. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool idea. What would P Barnum's X-Men would have been? <laughs> You know what I think? I think he, I think of him as like an Elon Musk. I think he'd be in virtual reality. He would have loved virtual reality. Thank you. So he gets the whole gang together, including Zendaya and her uh, uh, boyfriend, brother, father, cousin, best friend. I, I don't know what their connection is. Watching this scene, I just have to wonder, why are they part of the freaks again? I know the reason the movie gives is about their race, but didn't the flyer ask for people with interesting physical oddities? Why, why are they here? Why is someone that looks like Zendaya here amongst people like Dogman? No disrespect to Dogman, you're, you're beautiful in your own way, I, I'm, ju I'm just saying. Now that he's assembled the whole crew of freaks, Hugh goes to find the last piece of the puzzle. Zac Efron, a wealthy producer who has been very successful making shows for the general audience. But then Hugh convinces Zac to join the circus, and then Zac likes Zendaya, and she just sort of looks pouty at him, and, and then Zac goes up to the freaks and says, We're going to the Queen of England now, even though the show only has a mild audience consisting primarily of the people in the town that the show is located in, and yet somehow has reached the attention of the highest figures in European royalty after only being around for like a week. And then they go, yeah, that's a great idea. So they go to meet the queen, but more importantly, they meet Jenny Lind, who Hugh decides to eventually go on tour with, ditching the circus to the care of Ephron. This, of course, goes poorly and eventually leads to the circus burning down and Jackman being left with no choice but to abandon fame and act as a family man again. So all the freaks reconcile with Jackman and the circus is rebuilt in the form of a tent that we know today and Ephron takes it over the end. Ultimately, it's not a complicated storyline and I don't think it has to be. It is, after all, just a family-geared musical, but the story beats and developments are so predictable and basic that there's honestly no suspense in anything that happens, which would probably be alright if the way the film was crafted wasn't playing it safe too. You can have a very simple story that still works as a film if the way the film is made is unique enough to excuse it. Although, that still sometimes isn't enough. But the cinematography, editing, and sound design all go for the basics of filmmaking. There aren't that many interesting shots or shot compositions. The editing is by the books and linear, as you'd expect. And the sound design is just big and loud and great and doesn't do much to enhance the film. The lighting is sometimes interesting, and the production design has its moments, but then you have things like the CG lions. No. The writing in this film is about as basic as the songwriting is, and you're gonna notice that this film basically follows the same two or three themes throughout that are drilled into your head by the end of it. No one watches this movie for the dialogue. Even people that love this movie don't like the dialogue. It's all too simple, the conversations are played out and predictable, and every scene eventually devolves into follow your dreams, or be yourself. And that's about it. Now I know what everyone's thinking. Now wait just a minute there. You're forgetting the best part of this movie. What about the soundtrack? Oh no. I didn't forget. The Greatest Showman's soundtrack is, at best, a soundtrack your high school choir friend has on repeat on their iPhone or a steady stream of radio songs you might hear on Coast 103.5 at any given time of the day. It's nine songs long, but don't be fooled, it's actually all the same exact songs sung nine different ways and occasionally sung by slightly different people. Sure, the lyrics are different in the word choice, but ultimately the theme of all these songs is the same as the dialogue's themes of dream following and yourself being. First you have The Greatest Show, which just sort of introduces the tone of every song in the film. It's big, it's loud, show-stopping, lots of synth-based instruments, and lyrics vaguely talking about how awesome and rad the movie is. I, I mean, the circus is. It's talking about the circus and also the movie. It gets followed up with A Million Dreams, which is the most on-the-nose title of all the songs. It talks about following your dreams and wanting to change your destiny, has pretty much the same structure as the previous song and the same composition. There's nothing special here. Now what's interesting about this part of the film is that the song goes on for like 11 minutes. I'm not exaggerating either, by the time the song starts and then finishes, it's a total of like 11 or 12 minutes. It's just... 
I mean, the third song is Come Alive, which is yet another big, loud showstopper about being alive and being yourself. You might be noticing a pattern here. After that is The Other Side, which breaks up the tradition of the previous three songs by, surprise, having lyrics that actually apply to the story at hand, albeit for only like 20 seconds. Well, it's intriguing, but to go would cost me greatly. So what percentage of the show would I be taking? Fair enough, you'd want a piece of all the action. I'd give you seven, we could shake and make it happen. Well, as I'm going this morning, 18 would be just fine. Why not just go ahead and ask for nickels on the dive? 15, I do eight, 12, maybe nine. <laughs> No joke, this is probably my favorite part of the soundtrack because it actually advances the story like a song in a musical is supposed to do. Efron doesn't want to do the circus at the beginning of the song and is then convinced to join by the end, marking progress in the story. Amazing, right? Still, this victory is short-lived as the soundtrack follows up a brief moment of good storytelling through song with Never Enough, a boring power anthem about wanting more in life that sounds more fitting for an Adele performance than a song that's supposed to push a story forward. This one goes the extra mile and literally stops the story so that Lind can perform the song. Now I know a lot of people are going to argue here that La La Land, a movie which critics and audiences both liked, also had a song in it that stopped the story to perform a musical number without really developing a character or advancing the plot forward in Start a Fire, which was performed by John Legend and Ryan Gosling. And even though they're written by the same two songwriters, I'd argue that Start a Fire is intentionally out of place in the world of La La Land. Every other song does its best to advance the story in some way or another. Another Day of Sun doesn't do a lot to begin a plot device, but it does establish the general tone of things. City of Stars is quiet, introspective, too simple for a lot of people, but ultimately gets its point across of this is sort of a, a magical city for people. Everyone loves LA because it's all star-filled. Someone in the crowd talks about Emma Stone wanting to get famous, etc, etc, etc. But then you have this song, which is basically just a pop song being performed by John Legend and Ryan Gosling. And yes, that is out of place in a musical that's supposed to tell a story. But that's done for purpose because it's supposed to show in the context of the story that Ryan Gosling is doing something that is not personal or passionate. He's just performing a big, bassy pop song to an audience of screaming people that love a simple chord progression. It's intentional to show that what he's doing isn't human anymore. It's not very passionate at all. So it works in that sense because it shows that he's at a place in his life where all he's doing is performing these pop songs that you hear on the radio. It's crowd pleasers, it's showstoppers, it's all the same thing. The Greatest Showman does never enough as a song not to show any dishuman connection, but rather to stop and have us listen to a cool voice that's been auto-tuned and goes along with a bunch of stringed instruments. It's, it's just... It's annoying. I can't believe these are the same two people that wrote songs for La La Land that also wrote songs for this mess. The next song is This Is Me. The Oscar nominated This Is Me. Everyone's favorite song. And coincidentally, my least favorite. It is hands down the most basic and simple song lyrically in a soundtrack full of basic and simple lyricism. And musically, it sounds more fitting for a 2005 pop station. But really, the fact that this was nominated for an Oscar shows how manipulative these songs can be. People will look at how big and flashy the musical numbers are and how catchy the tune is without considering how well it fits into the story or how carefully it was constructed. Look at a song that was also nominated for an Oscar that year. History of Love by Sufjan Stevens for the Call Me By Your Name soundtrack. It's a peaceful, serene love melody that perfectly captures the vibe of the film while also being better produced and written and performed. I know it isn't the same kind of song, Mystery of Love is just in the background of the film, while This Is Me is an actual musical number, but I'd argue that Mystery of Love acts as a far superior tone setter for the film at hand and also proves to be a great song without resorting to sounding like Roar or Brave or one of the other nameless inspirational radio tracks. The next song is Rewrite the Stars, a duet between Efron and Zendaya that once again talks about changing destinies and stuff. The production design isn't too bad, but it's still pretty bland. Then there's the song that not even people who like this movie remember, 
Tightrope, a short song sung by Michelle Williams that sounds like it belongs on Fun's first album and talks more about wanting more in life. You get the picture. It all culminates with From Now On, which, you guessed it, talks about being yourself and following your dreams and sounds like a choir kid's jam session with their friends. I think the biggest problem with this soundtrack is that it completely fails as a musical storytelling device. You always hear that the only way that a musical truly works is if the songs either develop a character in a significant way or if they advance the story forward. Even though technically some songs sort of develop character in this film, none of them do it in a way that hasn't already been done through dialogue ultimately making these songs pointless for storytelling. Again, the lyrics are such a big problem. Listening to these songs just for the lyrics, I'd have no idea that it was from a story. It all just sounds like a series of pop songs that don't really have anything in common other than vague themes of dream following. You look at the lyrics for any big musical song, Book of Mormon, Rent, Les Mis, the list goes on. And usually with the good musicals, you can tell right away that it's part of a story but these songs in Greatest Showman give no indication that it is. When I hear a song at a party or whatever, and it's a song from a musical, my first thought should be, huh, I wonder what this is from, not, huh, I wonder who sings this. It's just an important distinction that I think marks good musical songs from bad ones. As a musical, it fails to tell a story through music or lyrics, and as a movie, it fails to be interesting enough to sell a story that ultimately focuses too much on a couple overplayed themes and messages. Granted, it is flashy, the songs are not not catchy, and the actors are pretty much all likable, but it just isn't enough for me. Or, as the film would say, never enough. <laughs> I guess this film had a million dreams that were broken by me. <laughs> Tightrope. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, if you like The Greatest Showman, that's awesome. It just, it's just not for me. Uh, if you liked the video, feel free to give it a like, comment below. Let me know what you think about The Greatest Showman. And uh, I'm sure I'll be putting out more of these reviews real soon. So uh, until then... Keep on, uh, just keep on, uh, keep on, yep. Angry.